irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on LA Talk Radio. Greetings to all of you listening around the world, and a warm welcome as we bring you another edition of the Answers for the Family radio show. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and each week this show will address issues such as family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and many things that will improve our lives. Having over 30 years' experience working with families in crisis, I've been fortunate to meet and work with some of the top professionals in many of the helping fields and skilled authors who are working to make this world a better place for all of us. Now, for everybody out there, I'm looking for some show ambassadors who will forward at least one of our shows to your social media group and to someone you know who can benefit from a particular show. So I want you to know that I truly appreciate it, and this is just another way that we, as a group, can make a positive difference in the lives of others. Now today, we're going to be talking about how the world is changing for women and girls. Our guest, Karina Chocano, has gone back and done archaeology about what happened in the past and how it has shaped women today. Karina is a contributing writer to New York Times Magazine. Her work has also appeared in Elle, Vogue, Rolling Stones, and many other publications. She has been a film and TV critic at the Los Angeles Times, Entertainment Weekly, and Salon.com. Her new book, You Play the Girl, on Playboy Bunnies, Stepford Wives, Trainwrecks, and other mixed messages, was the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. In You Play the Girl, Karina blends personal stories and powerful analysis, from Bugs Bunny to Playboy Bunnies, from Flashdance to Frozen, or from the 70s to today, she explains how growing up in the shadow of, quote, the girl, taught her to think about herself and the world and what it means to raise a daughter in the face of these contorted reflections. Karina, welcome to Answers for the Family. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for the great intro. Well, you're very welcome. Um, I'm so glad to meet you. Uh, It's very enlightening being able to go through the book and uh, and get your take on things. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed it. But I, I think my first question, and you know, is that you know, what was the genesis of these essays? You know, were they topics that you'd already been thinking about, or had you just been watching and consuming so much media that they then were brought about these ideas? Kind of both of those things. It was a very kind of long process, and and I guess an organic process. I was a pop culture critic, a staff critic um, for many years for about a decade, and, and I sort of spent my, you know, my work life was mostly spent consuming um, a lot of mainstream pop culture. Um, but I'm also, you know, I, I was a competitive literature major. I was always a, a big reader, and um, so I, you know, spent my life also reading stories and consuming um, s- stories. And so it sort of reached a point, I guess, around... Um, 2007, 2008, where I was working at the LA Times and I was really noticing um, a certain narratives that just were so prevalent uh, and, you know, both on screen um, with the sort of rise of the so-called like bromance comedies and, um, and how the female characters were always sort of relegated to the sidelines even more so than usual. And at the same time, in the way that the media even sort of um, mirrored and perpetuated these stories. And like one of the things that really got to me at the time was the way that, um, these, the, there was a sort of moment where all these young pop starlets were sort of crucified and sort of, you know, um, kind of treated, you know, the whole train wreck idea of like these girls falling apart, um, and, and the culture kind of going after them in a certain way. Like it really started to get under my skin and, I really just started thinking about all of these things. And um, I, oh, there was a, an interview that I heard, that I read with the actress Isla Fisher, um, who was asked if she'd gotten a lot of offers to play the lead in comedies 
after she um, kind of stole the show in The Wedding Crashers, and she said, no, because in Hollywood, all the parts are written for men, and you play the girl. So it really just got me thinking about how, you know, it, it sort of crystallized the idea for me. And after that, I started thinking about writing a book, but it ended up happening sort of slowly. Um, I wrote essays for the New York Times Magazine, and after a while, realized I had part of the book underway. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and and so came the name. You play the girl. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, a, you know, as a critic, and obviously you're you're not only watching art, but you're also dealing with the artists. Um, are you able to separate the art from the artist? And is that getting harder to do in this post Weinstein or post Me Too moment? Well, you know, I think at the time that I was that these the essays were first coming together, and that I was first thinking about it. I wasn't, I wasn't interacting with artists quite as much um, as a critic. I was really just going to see films and watching TV. But I, you know, I had the occasional profile or something that I would do. Um, and, also, and also just like I, like I mentioned, it just through the media you started to see the, the kind of meta-narrative, you know, where, the, where say, Britney Spears was a kind of a character in a, in a kind of a real life drama that was very much being constructed in the media, you know, and I started to really think about, you know, what, it, how, what is real about the story and what is true about the story and what isn't, you know, because it, there was a moment where there was no sort of space around um, we, where we, there was no questioning kind of, of, of the narrative, Lindsay Lohan going, you know, to court again and again and again and again. It all it all started to feel like a kind of a a real life soap opera that was being shaped, very much shaped by the gossip media. Mm-hmm. And once I started, like you mentioned in the in the um, in the uh, intro, once I started gigging, it was a little bit like like archaeology. So I started to, I guess, I started to try to make a separation between. Um, the artist and the art and to see where sometimes even real people are caught up in these narratives and how, and how pervasive these narratives are and how we have trouble stepping outside of them, even even as real people in real life. You know, you, you just mentioned a real life soap opera. And uh, just as you were saying that we have a question, a comment and a question coming in from a listener uh, and and mm-hmm. you, when you said real life soap opera, and I looked at this question, I thought this is perfect. It says, "What are your thoughts on the royal marriage of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle?" Um, this, <laughs> I have a lot. <laughs> I, I'm sure you Go do, ahead, but let, let, let me finish it because they, <laughs> yeah. they have a comment too. It says, "History and the movie The King's Speech reminds us of a king that had to give up his throne to marry an American." Now there are millions of young girls around the world that watched the wedding and saw a middle class. American woman marry a prince. Do you think this helps or hurts the cause? And this is from May in Los Angeles. It's so interesting. I um, I I happened to catch it. I, I woke up, you know, I had insomnia. <laughs> then I ended up on Twitter and catching a lot of it live. And um, and it's so fascinating. And I think there's so much there. And it's such. Um, it's such a snake eating its own tail, this whole thing, you know, because yes, like in the, and I was just reading something this morning about the history of um, royal marriages to commoners and how, how that's evolved and how even the laws and the laws have evolved. Um, My thought on seeing the wedding, honestly, I, you know, I I might, people might hate me for saying this, but I I was a little bit bummed (laughs) out. the whole thing it felt very um i felt like i was watching a julia roberts movie from the 90s <laughs> it felt like a disney movie to me it was a weird genre mashup that i couldn't wrap my head around the the extreme kind of the the mashup of like celebrity and um and you know the the the, the minister and then the shots to the royal it just it all felt like, like, it reminded me of that Julie Andrews and Anne Hathaway movie the, about the girl who finds out she's a princess. It felt very much like it was telling the story that these princess movies have been telling for a long time in which 
there's a kind of a dream of what a princess is, but but at the same time, there's this kind of American notion of what a relatable good girl is, and she is obviously a klutzy or, you know, more humble origins girl from a middle class family and and then she shows shows these stuffy royals how to be a cool girl <laughs> you know the whole thing is like I, was, I felt like I've seen it so often in the movies and here it is playing out in real life and it just felt like a triumph of this very silly story and I, I, I think that it uh, from my perspective it hurts more than helps I think that through stories like that, starting with Pretty Woman, which was a kind of a Cinderella story um, that's extremely implausible and has all these unexamined, I you know, ideas in it, it basically tells girls that you know the best thing you can aspire to is to do nothing, is to have everything in exchange for nothing, and and to sort of stop, you know, like it's the end of a story. Like now, Meghan Markle can't work you know and presumably she's an artist she's an actress you know that artists don't retire you know they're not like looking to clock out right it's mm-hmm. presumably it's something that you itself you know that you love to do and that expresses who you are and that is part of your purpose and your identity but she has to give that up and and has to give up all kinds of other things i think including nail polish i mean kind of everything that you might choose to do for yourself um, in order to sort of be this figure of wealth and leisure and adulation. And I think that that story has been told to us so relentlessly now since the early 90s that it's created a whole, I think, really negative fantasy that's really pervasive in our culture, which is, you know, this kind of like absolute... um, incredible wealth and leisure in exchange for, for your prettiness. And I, I don't think that's a good thing. Well, yeah. And I think you, you touched on it, but uh, you know, m- my initial thought uh, when I saw some clips of it was, wow, did I somehow turn to the Hallmark channel because I'm, I'm watching yeah. a Hallmark movie, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. It was a Disney movie or a Hallmark movie. It was, it was a weird uh, mashup. And of course it's now been, I would say also, it's been so commercialized, this idea. It's like maybe with, you know, Prince, like I was, yeah, I was a little girl when, when Prince Charles and Princess Diana got married. And in fact, I had, I grew up in, in Spain and I spent the summer in London, the, the summer before they got married. Like I was home a week before they got married. So I was kind of in that soup of, you know, leading up to the Royal wedding in England. And, um, and I think that at the time, obviously, it was a huge, you know, it was a huge television spectacular whenever that was in the 80s sometime. But um, but by now, it's basically turned into, you know, it, I'm, I don't know how many viewers they had, but it's basically the Oscars or something. And um, I think that there's a, there's a consciousness of, like, what a money making spectacular this is. And I don't know, the whole thing feels like it rests on all kinds of things that I think are uncomfortable and these narratives that are uncomfortable and that are not, not nearly examined enough, which is just, you know, how um, the certain transactional aspects of marriage, um, the commodification of women, and the commodification of like love. And it's really, it's really an interesting thing. I was not, I did, it, I was a little bummed out that day. I was like, I sound like such a curmudgeon. It was beautiful and I'm happy for that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's still, you know, it, it troubled me for like 24 hours. Well, one of the things that's intrigued me about your story is, um, is that you also have a daughter. And so there, mm-hmm. there is this now, this thing of, you know, so tell us a little bit about how, like, you know, that there's the books and the movies that you loved as a kid, and, and you've talked about the fact on, on how they define you, and, and, and me as a father, I think of some of the things that I want to show my, my sons, you know, of what, you know I, I want them to see certain things, and there's other things I'd prefer they didn't. Um, yeah. But I'm curious as to, you know, what you're seeing now. 